Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Nancy Gowdy, director of New Generation Music. Nancy Gowdy, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here with you. I was uh, thinking this morning, Nancy, I think I've known you and your husband, Ray, who's in heaven now, mm. for 40 years, actually. You, you do. You know, as from the beginning, <laughs> almost the beginning of when we went into full time ministry. I, that's we met right. you just after that. And it was, oh. Yeah. I know. I can't believe we've known each other for that For four time. decades. <laughs> 40 years. <laughs> now, your, your journey of faith, uh, you encountered Jesus as a young girl. I did. At age six? Six. Got, tell us what happened. Well, it's quite a remarkable and supernatural story, actually, because I was brought up um, in a family that knew God, loved God, taught me to pray every night before my bed. And I, I was taught to kneel before my bed and, and pray. And one night I decided to ask my dad if I could become a Christian. And he kind of looked at his six-year-old daughter and thought, does she really know what she's doing? And he kind of put me off and said, you know, why don't you become a Christian when you're a little bit older? I just accepted that. But God obviously had different ideas because that night my mom was out at church with two friends. My dad was at home and my little brother, he was putting my little brother to bed. I was standing in the lounge, not thinking anything about God or Christianity or anything. And then all of a sudden, I lost the power to stand. And I, I fell to my knees. And the way I fell, I fell in front of the couch. And I pushed against the couch to try and get back up and couldn't. And so I get so exhausted trying that I lay my head on the couch. And I thought to myself, I'll have a little rest and then I'll try again. And I was had my rest and then I thought, right, let's get up from here. And I went to get up and I couldn't get my head off the couch. And suddenly it dawned on me, I was in a praying position. And it was as if a hand had been put over the back of my, my neck and a hand over the back of my legs. And you know, I knew that God was speaking to me and I kind of heard this voice saying, Nancy. And I thought, he wants me to become a Christian, but I don't know how to become a Christian. So I said my first ever real prayer that wasn't my mom and dad prompting me how to pray. I said, dear God, I'll tell my daddy. <laughs> and immediately pressure lifted from my neck and from my legs. And I stood up. And then about two seconds after I stood up, my father came into the room and I told him what happened. And he says, come on, I'll tell you how to become a Christian. And oh my goodness, John, the, the excitement, the joy of knowing Jesus just filled my whole being. And I was just so excited that I'd become a Christian. Um, I still had to go to bed, unfortunately, even though I'd become a Christian. But I tell you, I was bouncing on top of the bed. When did you start singing? Oh my goodness. Um, when I was a teenager, really. Um, but don't ask me to sing now. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I loved singing actually at the yeah. time. And um, I was in a couple of bands up in Scotland and my husband Ray yeah. was in another band, not the same one. And was, then, it, was your band called Unity? Well, the band that Ray and I then yes. were part of was Unity, yes. He, he and his brother started it. And it was kind of like um, ABBA style choir, yeah. you know, with an orchestra. And uh, we used to do performances all over Scotland, but then came into England as well and did some there and recorded albums and stuff like that as well. So had, you, our, had our own show on television, actually, you as did, well. Didn't you? Yeah. Yes, you met Ray on a bus. I did. <laughs> I can tell you've read my book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I met Ray going to a gospel concert in the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. And uh, I basically, my dad had said, look, I've got masses of tickets to go to this gospel concert. Sell them to your friends. And so I went out and I did that. We had a massive group of friends that went over a huge amount of churches. And so I, I sold them all to my friends and um, then got on the bus 
and uh, I had heard about this Ray Gowdy, who ha his reputation was that he was a very, you know, stunning looking guy. And I discovered that he was sitting on the back of the bus. So guess who went and sat next to him <laughs> but me? <laughs> and that's how we first met, actually, when I was only 14 years of age. Wow. Um, we didn't go out until we were, I was 16, but yeah. But then later on, you, um, you, the band was formed. Yes. Ray was the drummer. He was the drummer. And you were the... I was one of the singers, yeah. And that developed into becoming Heartbeat. Heartbeat, Ray and I started um, in 1981, during, during 1980, 81. And uh, basically we had just joined Youth for Christ and we wanted to put a team together, a band together that really loved Jesus, that their passion for Jesus was the first thing in their heart and music was kind of the second, but we wanted them to be good musicians and, and good vocalists. And so there was only Ray and I, and so we prayed and God brought in another four people. And those four, plus ourselves, the two of us, six of us, became Heartbeat. And we started in 1981 and we finished in 1991. I remember Nancy, I remember you and Ray in Heartbeat. And it, it, it was a time where there was, you could say, a real wave mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And God significantly used your ministry. Uh, as you look back during that season, um, is there a memorable highlight? Oh, there's so many. Honestly, I, there's just so many because God, through that 10 years we were together, God, it was almost like, it was almost like mini revivals happening all over the place where we would go to a particular city or town or place and God would move in incredible ways. I'll never forget Birmingham. I must tell you about yes. Birmingham, where um, we went to do a, a mission in Birmingham. We were there for a week, and at the end of the week, we did our concert where we invited all the school children to come. And we never knew how many would come because we never sold tickets. We just said, here's a leaflet, bring the leaflet with you. This will enable you to get in. But really, they didn't need the leaflet. It was just to encourage people to come. And uh, we had it, I think, in a town hall in Birmingham. And as it was, it took 600 people and it was absolutely packed. So much so that the Christians had to leave. And so we did our concert and we did our, at the end, my husband did a 10 minute preach. He invited people to stand if they wanted to give their lives to Christ. And they all stood. And you can see, there's a video of this, and you can see me coming to the, the stage and beside Ray going, Ray, they haven't understood you. They don't know what you're trying to ask them to do. Get them to sit back down. They don't, they don't understand. And so he was like, right, everybody sit down. And then he began to explain what a Christian is. You know, a Christian is turning your back on, on your sin and turning your back on things that you want to do and saying to God, God, you're boss of my life. So if you want to become a Christian tonight, and only if you want to become a Christian, you stand to your feet. They all stood again. And so again, you can see me coming up to Ray going, Ray, they definitely haven't understood you. Because you see, what I saw was this older couple in the balcony and I thought to myself, they're in their 60s, 70s, they must be Christians. And they were standing. So I thought they ha he definitely hasn't understood them, you know. So anyway, Ray went, right, sit back down. <laughs> and then he got really angry with them and he said, now listen, God is not mocked. I only want you to become, you know, to stand up if you really want to give your life to Christ. And so he said, now only those who really truly want to give their life to Christ, stand up again. And they all stood That's again. Good. It was incredible. I always remember the minister uh, going to the guy who had organised the mission, saying, how many leaflets have you got to give to these people? And he was like, a hundred. He's that's not enough. <laughs> we need more. It was a great problem to have. But definitely, Nancy, revival moments. Oh, totally. But, but then the Lord... Um, guided you, instructed you and Ray to lay down heartbeat. Yes. You know, at the height of its fruitfulness. Yes. yes. Because did he reveal to you what was coming after or did he ask you to lay it down first? Well, NGM started its new generation 
ministry really um, started probably 1980, 1989 or 88, some, round about there somewhere. We changed the name of Heartbeat because the, the group of people surrounding Heartbeat were not just musicians, like we had youth workers, we had a dancer, we had a, administrators. And so we wanted to call the overall ministry something. And so we changed the name there. Um, then he told us to close Heartbeat down, the band. By that time, we'd had another band in Swindon. And we felt clearly from God that it wasn't, the, the, the main ministry wasn't going to close down, but Heartbeat was. And that actually led us through a year of closing, closing it down. It was quite hard, to be honest, because um, we wanted others in Heartbeat to pick up what God was saying. And they did, and they really did. But one guy had just joined us in December and we finished in September, the following September, and he was only with us for nine months. But you know, I spoke to him just recently and he said, Nancy, those nine months changed my life. Yes. So, you know, it was it was a tough time, but it was a, it was right. And God said to us that the arrows, he showed us a picture. In fact, he showed us it through Gerald Coates, actually. Um, and he, he, there was this prophetic word was given to Gerald for us that said that the main thing would move a few, you know, slightly away from where they were at present, which we did. We moved from Malmesbury over to Bristol and the arrows um, in heartbeat would go off and do different ministries. And that's yes. exactly what happened. We've, had, we've now got people working in various parts of the, the world that have started their ministries after heartbeat finished. I, and I, I like the ethos of NGM. You, you, you love God, yes. you love people, yes. you love creativity. We do, And you Very certainly much. have, over the years, invested in so many different people. Yes. Creative people yes. to communicate creatively. Yes. And, and, and to do that in two different ways. Because right at the beginning of our ministry, we wanted to, you know, encourage and build up the church. So one, one leg, if you like, was going into the church, but the other was actually going into the mainstream. And so we wanted people to come and be trained, but to do both, to go into the church and encourage them. We've got worship leaders working in church, we've got pastors leading, you know, leading a church, etc., who were trained through NGM. And um, we've also got people working in the mainstream in people working in the West End, people working in the music industry, people working in clubland, um, and people working in the media, and all trained through NGM and have gone on to do incredible things and being salt and light in that area, much needed area actually, because that's a, a mission field that sometimes um, people don't realise, they just think it's a job, but actually what we wanted our people to do was to realise it was a mission field in there and to be able to, to see that and, and see God do amazing things through them. Well, certainly both through you, Nancy, and uh, Ray, um, as I've known you over the decades, you love God, both of you love yeah. people and love creativity. Absolutely. Uh, and release that in others. It reminds me of that uh, famous quotation from the evangelist D.L. Moody, I'd rather put 10 men to work than do the work of 10 men yes. and what you and Ray have done is that you've actually put hundreds of men and women to work yeah. rather than just try and do it yourself. So, exactly, exactly. Which is hugely fulfilling. Yeah. Well I mean God told us to impart to others what he had imparted to us and my heart just it still beats with the passion of loving and knowing Jesus, still does. And I think it always will do because he is just amazing. And both Ray and I wanted to communicate that to these young people who are coming into NGM at the time. They were maybe 17, 16, 17, 18 years of age. And at that age, give them a passion for Jesus, a real heart for God and for other people and begin to show other people what true Christianity is all about. Not just a religion, you know, because... Anyone can follow a religion, but to actually know and worship the living God is completely different to religion. It's a relationship with God. 
Well, the this book, um, who would ever have thought? I mean, <laughs> yeah, when you thought of a title to yeah. sum up decades of ministry, it, it's just full of God's miracles. It is. Uh, and who would ever have thought that God could use Ray and I to do that? Um, it almost makes me cry to to realise what he has done with a life that said, God, I'm yours. Uh, the thing is, he can do it with anybody. That's the lovely thing about it. It's not just, oh, it's only me and Nancy that can do that. God can do that through anyone, any one of us. And and he does, which is, which is wonderful. Now, dear Ray got ill. He did. And uh, battled with cancer. Yeah. And then was promoted to glory. He was. Um, and that must have been a difficult season for you. It was a very difficult season because we were expecting Ray to live and not die. And that wasn't just something that we assumed. It was something that we felt not just from ourselves and from what we were reading in the scriptures, but also through other people who and ministers who had been working in healing and miracles throughout the world were saying, Ray would live and not die. And so your faith was high, thinking, yeah, I know he's going through a real tough time. I know this is really difficult. Um, but there were signs along the way of sheer miracles that happened as he went through, well, a, a life-threatening operation, first of all, 12-hour operation. He came through that and came out. He was really thin, um, didn't have a lot of strength. The oncologist said, you will not be able to go through chemotherapy. And Ray said, well, if God wants me to go through chemotherapy, I will be the right weight. And, and God did. And we, we went, he went through chemotherapy. As he started the chemotherapy, the oncologist said, well, that's great, you've managed that, but actually you'll not finish the course. Um, because what will happen now is that you will lose weight which traditionally that seems to happen when you're on chemotherapy. But for him, he gained weight. And every time he went back, he, he never lost weight once, which was incredible. Um, after the chemotherapy, he then went through um, almost six weeks of radiotherapy. And again, God said, you will sail through it. And he did. And he even wrote worship songs in the middle of his radiotherapy. It was incredible. And he, he was you know, in touch with people who were patients at the same time and really deeply affecting them just exactly where he was. So our faith was high, really high. Um, he was then at one point said he was cancer free. Uh, they told us to go on holiday and enjoy ourselves, which we did. We didn't stay. We were planned to stay for two weeks, but we decided to stay for a month, came back. And after we came back, he went in to get results of a scan he had had and the doctors told him he had two days left to live. Mm. I was, I mean, we were both shocked. We were like, what? Um, towards the end of the holiday, he did start to feel sore um, and in pain. Um, so we knew something was going on, but it was, it was really hard and really difficult. And um, we called our son over in America because he lives over there. He came back. Um, they took him back into hospital. He was in hospital for some weeks and um, he then was released from hospital because they said he was too well to be in hospital. <laughs> so they said, You're, you can go home. Um, so he went home and within two months of the two days thing, um, one day he, he, he was coming off all medication. So he didn't have like lots of drugs on him, lots of morphine, etc. He was he was coming off all that. I think he was in the, had a driver in his arm and he had the equivalent of five mils of morphine mm. in him per day. And he was about to get that taken away that day because he didn't need it. And the nurse came and he said, oh, do you know, I'm just feeling a little bit tired today. He said, do it tomorrow. It's fine. Do it tomorrow. So that's, she said, that's fine. Um, that night uh, he had, was sleeping most of the day and I went down to get some dinner that someone had prepared for me. Uh, I was only gone 10 minutes. I ate the dinner, came back straight back upstairs, but he had gone. Yes. In that 10 minutes, he had gone. And I was distraught. 
I mean, distraught, because um, it wasn't what we were expecting. And all the questions come to your mind. God, what are you doing? What's, what, what's this isn't right, you know? And of course, I prayed for Ray, I commanded the spirit of death to leave him. I, I did everything that you're taught to do, but nothing. And um, I remember that night saying to God, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand what's going on. And I began to think in my mind, is God not real? Is everything I have lived for, everything I've believed in, just rubbish? And I have to say, the enemy said to me right at that moment, God has turned his back on you. Turn your back on him. I considered it for about two seconds. Yes. And then I thought, no, I can't. I know God. I don't understand this, but I know him. And so I remember that night then standing before my bed, the, the very bed that Ray died in, and saying to God out loud, because I felt I wanted to say it out loud. I said, God, I do not understand what has happened. I have 101 different questions. But I want to say to you, I'm not called to understand everything, but I am called to trust you. Yes. And trust you is what I'm going to do. And I went to bed, still breaking my heart um, because of Ray. And God gave me a gift. He gave me the gift of peace that passes all understanding. I mean, I've always wondered what that kind of peace is like. Oh my goodness, it just came on me. And although I'm still crying, it didn't stop me mourning or whatever, because obviously I'd been married for 43 years. I loved my husband with everything I have, I still do. But that night, God gave me a gift of peace and it just came on me and it just quietened my soul. And also he gave me something that I, I didn't even want to tell anyone that I had, but he gave me what I described as a bubble of joy. Oh. And I thought, how can you have joy when you're mourning? How can I have joy when Ray's just died? And yet I did. In, inside, I had this spring of joy. And, you know, I, I couldn't tell anyone because I was like, they'll think I'm mad, you know. But, you know, those two gifts have never left me, never left me. And through all the heartache and the, the funeral and the celebration we had for Ray's you know, life and, and for the years that we've now gone by, because it's almost five years this year, those two gifts have never gone away. And I have to say, if I hadn't had my relationship with God, I could not have survived. I could not have survived that happening. But God has been just incredible. He's my husband, he's my father, he's my king, he's my God, he's my Lord, he's my saviour, he's just everything. I mean, Ray, tell you a funny story, Ray, Ray always said he was the finder because he used to, I, I would lose everything and he would find it. And I said to the Lord after Ray had died, you know, a number of months or years, I lost my keys and I said, God, you, you're the finder now. Ray used to be the finder, but he's no longer here. So I'm saying, you have to be the finder. You have to tell me where those keys are. And you know, God immediately put it in my mind where they were. I, I, he said, go upstairs into your, into your wardrobe. There's a handbag you haven't used for years. Your keys are in there. And sure enough, it was my second set of keys, the other set I'd given to someone. And sure enough, those keys were in that handbag. It's just a, it's a silly illustration, but it's so no, wonderful of what God has, has done for me. And, you know, I, I always say I live alone, but I'm never alone. He's with yeah. me throughout my whole time. Do you know something? I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to him for all that he's done in my life. And amongst so much that you and Ray did, uh, Ray encouraged you to do these spiritual health weekends he did. and to write about spiritual health. Yeah. And here's your new book, Spiritual Health Encounters. And uh, tell us about that because it's 25 years that yes. you've been doing this. Yes. Well, 
I remember when I was preaching in America at one point and God said to me, when you go back to, the, to Britain, I want you to start a spiritual health weekend, um, a, a basically a, a weekend for women. And I was like, God, you've got the wrong person. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't really like women's events. I'm so in those days, 25 years ago, women's events were kind of like second class, I always felt. And I didn't really want to do that. And God said, yes, but what if you had a plain piece of paper? What would you put on it? Well, I started to write down what I'd put on it, what I'd want in a spiritual health weekend for women. And I got so excited. And God said, go and do it. And so I did. I started it in 1997. And uh, we didn't have the 25th year. should have been 2021, but it, we, we had to postpone it because of COVID, of course. And so we're having it in 2022, February 11th to 13th, 2022, we'll be holding the Spiritual Health Weekend in Birmingham in the Hilton Hotel. That was one of the things I wanted to do was to make it in a hotel where I had the facilities to, to bless people, you know, and uh, so we had it in a hotel. It's got jacuzzis, it's got swimming pool, it's got everything. Plus we provide like pampering treatments and we have our fantastic band to lead worship. We have you know, uh, people like myself and also I invited guests like you to come in and speak uh, as a special guest at it. Uh, and we've got prayer rooms and we've got a special night where we have like a, a banquet meal and we all get dressed up for the banquet meal. And then we have five star entertainment from NGM, uh, from our artists and from people that are involved with us. And it's, it's fantastic. It really is. And it's in that environment where what we saw in the 80s with Heartbeat, I'm now seeing in my spiritual health weekends through what God is doing in them. And it's just incredible. Signs of revival, you know, healings, people getting saved and set free. And um, just um, I've got amazing stories of what God has done. Well, I think, Nancy, you know, from the age of six, you had your own spiritual encounter and uh, you've just been a pursuer of God. And um, the thing I, 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 I sense, having known you for several decades, is that you know, you're spiritually healthy, mm. and uh, that's why you do spiritual health weekends yes. and encounters. Yes. Nancy, it's been a joy to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's been a privilege. Wow, I hope that has inspired you. Um, that we can have spiritual encounters with God and that God is pursuing us and we need to pursue him. So I, I hope that's encouraged you in your own journey of faith. Thank you very much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.